So uh, we are presenting today about best practices in narrative podcasting in academia. My name is Sage Tangway. Um, just so we can uh, all be clear on who is who. I'm Sage Tangway. I'm an audio producer for Brown Residential College at the Virginia Audio Collective at WTJU 91.1 FM. And I'm Mary Garner McGee, and I'm also an audio producer at WTJU. And I also work with the Sound Justice Lab at UVA. And we are both huge radio and podcasting nerds. In addition to working in the space, I think we both got into it because we were big fans. Big, big fans. Um, it was basically all I did with my free time when I was probably starting when I was 16. All I ever did was listen to Radio Lab and NPR. Uh, and then that just continued through college. And that's where I started actually doing radio. And also, have any of you heard of the show Backstory, the history podcast? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So that was one of the first podcasts that I really listened to. And it was a narrative podcast in academia um, here at UVA. Great show that went on for a long time. So that was a little bit about us. Um, but now we want to see kind of who is in the room today. Uh, so we have a list of questions. They're actually going to be sent out as a poll um, by uh, by our lovely Rebecca. host, Rebecca. Yeah. And Let's see how it goes. I'm going to hit the launch those. button. Woo. Wonderful. Okay, awesome. I think we have do do we? Oh, no. I'll just, I'll just read through them as we're like answering them. Um, but please do participate. Um, we we're joking with Rebecca at the beginning. You know, we're radio podcast people. We are obsessed with audience. So we want to know who our audience is today. Um, so the first one is, do you work on one podcast or do you work on multiple podcasts? Um, what kind of podcast do you make? We already have awesome. Um, the third one, how many people are on your team? Um, some shows have pretty small teams, some have bigger ones. Um, did you work in media or podcasting before academia? Um, I feel like there's a good number of people at UVA that actually did work mm -hmm. in media yeah. before getting into academia, which yeah. It's a pretty interesting and cool thing for our podcasting scene. Um, love to see that most people do listen to podcasts. Yay! <laughs> Occasionally people come in to make podcasts and they, I'm like, what podcast do you like? Um, like? And I have to say, I actually think it's really cool. Like you don't have to listen to podcasts, but it, it's a good I start. think it helps. It's yeah. a good start. It definitely helps. And then do you make money off of your podcast? Okay. And while we're waiting for everyone to sort of um, answer those, uh, we can talk a little bit about what we do here at UVA. Um, basically, we are embedded at WTJU FM, which is the university community radio station. So it was started how many years ago? Almost 70. Almost 70. Um, by some students at UVA. It has since become more of a community focused station, but there's still like a really strong tie to what's going on at the university. Um, and we also have a student station, WXTJ, that is fully DJed by students. Um, and we also have a lot of other offerings going on. Uh, we recently had a retreat where we talked about how uh, our brand is becoming a larger and larger umbrella of just like general media and community creation. So um, that's sort of the perspective a lot of what we're talking about today is coming from, where we have a really prime position to be working in podcasting at a university, and, and uh, that's what this whole thing is about. Yeah. So um, it looks, this is your last chance. I'm going to do like a countdown to 10 <laughs> and then Rebecca, if we could end it and share the results, that would be great. All right, here we yes, go. We Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Yeah, share Yay. results. Okay. Should I click? This? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. This okay. is our first poll, y'all. Okay. Um, Oh, great. There's yeah. a lot of narrative podcasts in the room, it looks like. Not many rant podcasts, but um, that was what I was expecting. Some oh, of these are giving answer. us weird. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it's just like, yeah, people answered it. Yeah. So we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to get Go more back information and those. about yeah. those. Um, how interesting. Maybe if 
Maybe if we stop sharing, it'll we can be keep good. going. Okay, we'll we're all good. Back. We'll sure. investigate. I'll let you know how I figure it out. When I click on view details under each question, it asks me to re sign in. So if I can, I'll take a screenshot of it. <laughs> okay, no worries. No worries at all. This was an experiment. Um, it, it is good to know that we're about evenly split between um, or doubly split between uh, interview, narrative, and chat. So, um, okay. All right. So we'll we'll get into the the meat of things. Um, okay, so we wanted to start this presentation off with a little overview of what's been happening in the wider world of podcasting. Um, and the headline is that you know starting around 2022, um, there were a lot of layoffs in like big podcasting, both in the public side and the like private commercial side. Um, and this was hitting podcast shops from NPR to Spotify. Um, so laying people off, shrinking their teams and canceling some shows. So how many of y'all, if you could do like the show of hands thing, were aware of this? This is the show. All right, cool. Again, just helpful to see where people are coming from. Great. Um, so the the TDLR of the whole talk is that, you know, this is a huge bummer, like we're really sad about it. But, um, you know, we think narrative podcasts are really interesting and an important part of the format. And um, we think that this offers people in academia a big opportunity to kind of step into um, this space. So how many people have heard there are too many podcasts. Everybody has a podcast. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, well, there are a lot of podcasts, but the good news is that listenership is also up year over year. So this graph over on the left is like how many new podcasts each year. You'll see there was a huge spike in 2020. And then the graph on the right is how many people um, have ever listened to a podcast as a percentage of the American population. So you'll see on one of these graphs, we have nice steady growth. And on the other graph, we have kind of a big spike there. So there's a bit of a mismatch here, right? Like despite the fact that the growth has been steady for many years, um, there was kind of this like explosion of new content. And, um, you know, in terms of the layoffs and like the way that American attention <laughs> is divided and stuff, print and TV journalism have been struggling with this for a long time. But the reason that it's been getting a lot of attention is that it's kind of the first big shock that podcasting has had. You know, if you look at this chart on the right here, podcasting has really been growing consistently um, since they were created until about uh, 2022. Um, the other thing to know about the podcasting industry, which I'm sure most of y'all already know, is that um, it's highly bifurcated. So the medium podcast episode gets less than 32 episodes per week. There are a ton of big, well-resourced podcasts out there, both in public media and in commercial media. And then there are also a ton of indie producers. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about on the next slide here um, has more affected the big podcasters and those podcasters you know disproportionately set the tone for the rest of the industry because um they're getting the most listens okay so what is a narrative podcast so a narrative podcast and again we have a lot of narrative podcasters here so this is kind of getting us all on the same page um it's multi-voice, um, sound rich, all the things that you see up here. Um, and it's a lot of shows that, especially coming out of like the public radio aesthetic, like Serial, This American Life, Radio Lab, they have a really like rich soundscape and um, they also take a lot of research, especially compared to, um, you know, a chat cast or an interview, which also, you know, it, it takes work to put those together and research the guests and stuff. But um, and I think also, you know, for academics, like narrative podcasting in some ways, I think is more analogous to like writing a major research paper, um, speaking to a lot of people. Okay, so 
Now we wanted to talk a little bit about the various revenue sources for podcasts, um, because this is really relevant to why narrative podcasts specifically were hit so much harder in the past couple years than interview and chat cast shows. So I'm going to start over on the right here. Um, so that is representing revenue sources for commercial for-profit podcasts. So those are places like Spotify is probably like the most famous like podcast shop. There's a ton out there though. Like there are a lot of for-profit podcast networks. Mm -hmm. um, and then over on the left is non-commercial public. And again, like the most um, well-known one of these is the NPR network. So over on the right, um, you know, believe it or not, a lot of podcast companies had investment uh, capital in them, like investors. And so when the interest rates went up, there was less cheap money. And so um, investors came to those businesses that they had invested in and were like, where are our returns? Where are the listens? How are your ad sales doing? Um, so there was just less easy money, investment money out there. And um, places had to start showing that they were um, you know, revenue neutral or like turning a profit. Then in the middle are things that affect both the commercial podcast and the um, non-commercial podcast. So advertising sales were hit really hard around the same time. Um, you know, tech was hit harder than a lot of the rest of the economy in the past couple of years. And tech is really overrepresented in um, ad and underwriting sales on podcasts and on public radio. Um, so they pulled back um, on some of that money. Um, and then over on the left side, um, specifically looking at the grants one, a lot of public media is funded, at least in part, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And during COVID, they had emergency funding for a lot of stations, which was really important and kept a lot of rural in particular stations across the country on the air during COVID. Um, but, you know, that was one time emergency funding and it started to wind down in the past couple years. So all of this meant that shows with the biggest staffs, which tended to be those big narrative shows, they were the most expensive to produce and they were the most vulnerable, right? Like they had to, when a network is looking at how do we break even, um, those were the shows that um, they were really looking to. So there are fewer new narrative podcasts going forward than there were before. And some great narrative podcasts that had been on for a while also um, were canceled or at least scaled back or like people from their staffs were laid off. But I think, you know, the the real thing is that looking forward, I think a lot fewer of these projects are going to get greenlit than before. And um, can I say, I'll say also yeah. that part of this is like a natural contraction. What yes. we were seeing happen specifically at NPR was like they were creating these shows like Wildfire. Um, one of the most popular shows that I think got canceled very like infamously, at least in my scope of the media world, is Invisibilia, mm -hmm. um, which was started uh, as almost like a, a, a little bit of a branch off from Radio Lab, uh, WNYC's Radio Lab very popular show in concept but they just did not make it through the the budget cuts at all which is really sad um and but we we also feel like we might be able to shed some light on on why shows like that even though they have um what we would consider at least from the <laughs> from our perspective like great li listenerships just did not uh make it yeah and I want to point out um, the two two things in the middle that I didn't mention, which is premium content and subscriptions. And um, that's because I think, you know, this is actually something that's been a good source of growing revenue, like particularly for indie podcasts and um, could be a good opportunity for academics, commercial podcasts, indie podcasters. Um, so this is stuff like Patreon or like Substack. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so the, the overview of this slide is basically, um, 
you know, the the decline of narrative podcasts in the past couple of years is really unfortunate. But we also think, like I said, that it gives academia an opportunity to not just step in, but also maybe rethink the format a little bit, bring new ideas in. All right. So we just talked about why they're expensive and hard to make and hard to fund. Um, but so why should we make them at all? Right. You want to go to the next slide? Great. Um, people like them. They're really good to listen to. Like Serial was like the most popular first huge podcast that a lot of people listen to. Um, you couldn't make that show in an interview format. You couldn't make that show as a chat cast. Um, they're also a form of art. I mean, Sage and I were just at this like national podcasting conference a couple weeks ago. And like, man, the artists yeah. that are coming into this space and like, coming up with new exciting ways to tell stories and how to include music. I mean, it's just a really cool form of media. Um, and again, it, it really takes it beyond like the interview or the chat cast format. Um, I think very importantly, there are a lot of stories that are best told with multiple voices or you can't tell them at all without interviewing multiple people. Um, you know, no one is going to be an expert in every angle of something that you want to tell a story about. So um, narrative podcasts can be really important for those kinds of topics. Um, and similarly, there's a lot of power in storytelling um, that is hard to convey with a single conversation. Um, and they're more experimental, you know, like they're really driving the format forward. All right, here we go. <laughs> so this is what we see as a, a huge opportunity for academia. Um, as as the the podcast scape is shifting pretty dramatically. Um, and a lot of this comes down to to how these things can or do function at universities. Uh, an aspect that really uh, was a a death knell for these large productions was how large their teams were. You know, they had, you know, up to five full-time producers uh, on a single show and they're only producing episodes maybe once every two weeks or, you know, they're working on a season. So they work for half of the year on the season and the rest of the year it's released. Um, and there's, it's just, when you kind of get down to it, it doesn't seem very supportable, at least not forever, right? Now at universities, um, if you have people on staff um, who are able to really dedicate themselves as producers, um, that also means that you can start utilizing students and professors and staff members um, in sort of a, a multi-level team um that is a little bit more limited and a little bit more focused than what we see at some of the big shops it's also a grant funded system so as much as that can seem a little bit scary to rely on grants for things um i mean it's it's actually one of the more stable forms of of funding um because you're not having to perform for a a uh like a constant market um really what we're doing is we're saying, hey, this is a project we want to do. The uh, grantee, a grantor will say, yep, that sounds good to us. Like, here's your requirements um, and you accomplish it. And the reality is that universities projects that are funded by grants are happening constantly, all the time, everywhere, um, limiting the scope of time that we are working on a project also allows us to better pay the people working on it and credit that work. So um, at least here at UVA, we're not allowed to pay students for credited work. So there's either, uh, either we pay them as interns or they are also uh, working on it or, or they're just working on it as their focus for a semester for a class um, and they're receiving experience and credit for it. Um, but by saying that we're not, you know, going to continue this for years and years to come. Um, it allows us to kind of get a lot of work out all at once. Uh, and also at a university, we have multiple funding sources. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second when I talk about a, a show that I in particular worked on um, that really was a huge community effort in terms of how many different people we had funding it. 
Also, very obviously, there's a deep well of subject expertise. So at a university, there are lots of people who know lots of things and are usually fairly willing to talk about those things, uh, which is just such a boon for uh, someone with a recorder. And I'll add to that, too. They are allowed to say what they think about those things, too. Yeah. You know, if you're doing research on something and, you know, you want to know the facts, but sometimes you also really want someone to say, like, is the OK, you just told me about this whole process. Is it efficient? Right. Like, how would you do this differently? Sometimes it's really hard to find people who are able to tell you what something means. And again, not in like a partisan way, just in like a this is really complicated. Like, how do I digest this way? Um, so pretty obviously, MG and I are like totally bought into this system of working <laughs> working at a, at a university. Um, and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about like how each of our, our um, positions are actually partnerships between WTJU and other programs that are happening at the university. Um, but we wanted to offer two other perspectives of people who are connected to the Virginia Audio Collective um, to, to sort of round out some of the story that we're telling you. Our first one is Adrian Wood. Uh, they are a multimedia producer at the University of Virginia's Repair Lab. Um, they came to this line of work with a, an MFA in sound, um, and they produced Waiting Between Two Titans, which is uh, covers the housing, sorry, the convergence of housing and the history of race in the time of sea level rise in coastal Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and so we're going to go over real quick, and we're just going to take a look at what they have to say. Maybe I can use these skills to... I wanted to start podcasting because I knew that I had these skills in sound, and I wanted to offer the best skills I had to the world. Maybe I can use these skills to help disseminate useful information and align my productions with my values. Both of my positions with UVA have been grant funded, so we just don't have like infinity money to spend on a staff. I do everything for the podcast. I, in the past, I've worked with a story editor and that was like the only other person who touched it. This most recent season, I did invite a friend to do the score for it too, but being a one man show kind of gives you a lot of editorial authority, but also it's challenging because it's like sometimes other people are really smart and will have good ideas and you just like are not going to get access to that if you're the only person working on something. There's a lot of academic contacts that are just sort of built in where the professional academics who are on the lab that I work with will like, you know, connect me to their professional academic homies and be like, oh, you got to talk to this guy about this very specific niche topic that he has dedicated his life to studying. And so that can be cool because then you get this expert insight that documentaries rely on where it's like, yeah, what is the, what do the experts think? I don't have to look that hard to find them because I'm working with people who are like friends with them. Other stuff about working with the university is like great benefits, healthcare, because I'm not hustling a million jobs and like trying to fund my own position, I can really like dedicate a lot more time and focus to the work. I think one more thing to consider, this is really specific to the work that I do where I work for this lab that hires activists and supports them with institutional resources. And I basically act as a resource, like a storytelling resource for the activists that we hire and, and collaborate with. In that capacity, I'm frequently like traveling out of town to go interview people who have been affected by different kinds of injustice in their neighborhoods and communities. When I do that, because I work for UVA, I often will end up representing the institution to like those individuals who I'm speaking with. There's pros and cons to that for sure, you know, because UVA is this really big institution that has like a really racist history and, you know, a, a current like racist housing presence in Charlottesville. And so people will be like, 
oh, UVA, I don't mess with them. You know, I don't want to talk to you. But then the flip side of that is, oh, UVA. Sometimes that will give me access. I was really. Okay. So um, if you would just take a few seconds to like respond to that in the chat. Is there stuff that was surprising from Adrian's perspective? Are there things that just totally align with what you've heard before from, from uh, either from yourself, before, you experienced yeah. yourself as a producer um, or heard from producers you work with? I'd love to, to see if um, any of that sort of resonated with uh, your experiences. I think the bit about, you know, the ways in which the university can both be like an open door and a shut door is so interesting and something I've definitely experienced also. Absolutely. And I think that is a, a little bit different than if you're coming at it from a member of the media. You know, if you're just working with a radio station, um, there's a different set of expectations uh, that might be good or bad. But I, I do sort of uh, see it as a real different approach. Yeah. Yeah, you know, okay. we got a comment about somebody else doing it all on your own and yeah, pros and cons for sure. Yeah, getting all of that editorial control, but also having to make the decisions yourself and, and do all of the, the work for it. And I think also, you know, when like we work with a lot of students, right, and we're able to give the students a lot of feedback on the work that they do for us. But sometimes it's hard, <laughs> like you, you give students all this feedback as you're going and then it's done and you're like, you know, can somebody tell me how the whole thing is? <laughs> yeah, like, and yeah. like, we'll do it between colleagues and stuff sometimes, but it's different than being able to like sit down with a team of like four people and listen to a draft of the episode before it comes out and make changes and stuff. I, I love what I'm seeing here about um, the ability to experiment with each episode. Um, I definitely see universities as a, a prime place for experimentation um, in, in a way that the free market isn't always. Um, sometimes it is, but uh, and um, also, yeah, Rebecca, I, I totally feel that like trying to prove your um, ability and, and I guess like authority to be telling certain stories or receiving money to tell certain stories is definitely um, a big one. Yeah, freedom yeah. to focus on good, interesting, meaningful work that's compelling. Mm. Yeah, the funding of grants is insecure. It absolutely is. It, it, um, it, it's sad to me in some ways that grants are some of the most stable funding we can come into in this line of work um, because it, it's, really, it's really hard otherwise. And I think also like it's grants will let you embark on an ambitious project without having an existing large audience and outside of that sphere if you want to get funding to put something big together you need to come in and say i have these tens of thousands of listeners or even hundreds of thousands of listeners before people will let you will like give you the resources you need to do something like that yeah yeah Okay, we are going to Well, actually at first I wanted to mention some of the things that didn't make it into that clip mm. that that Adrian uh, expressed. Um, Adrian coming from the like sound art space uh, was very interested in seeing more and more experimentation. They really want to people to take big risks with the sounds that they're making um, and uh, in our conversation, there was a bit of a, a, a lament of the homogenization of popular podcast sounding, um, which I think is is really cool to keep in mind and a little bit inspiring to me. Someone else? Yeah, I we got a question about academic publishers, and I love that. And I actually, for a while during COVID, worked with the University of Virginia Press on a podcast that they made, and it was really fun and really interesting. Um, and I totally think more presses should do that. Um, I'll say like one challenge is that university presses, in, at least to my knowledge, tend to cover like a huge range of subjects. And I know one challenge they ran into was wanting to represent all parts of their catalog, but that can make it kind of hard to find a specific audience, right? 
um, it's hard to target the person that's going to be super interested in this like environmental history book and then next week be interested in you know like a, a physics book or those I mean those are at least both sciences like <laughs> You know, the yeah. next week be interested in like a book about medieval poetry. Um, so again, I think really cool. Um, but with a lot of parts of the university, honestly, finding that focus can be a challenge sometimes. Okay, we're going to take a look at our next perspective from UVA. Um, this is Benjamin Bernard. He is a historian of 17th and 18th century France. Um, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the U at UVA, and he was the executive producer of Sister Revolutions, um, which I co-produced with him on Symposia. Um, now, I'll just say sometimes in this conversation, he addresses me directly as his <laughs> as his sound producer, um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about. Well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you right now. It'll make more sense when we listen to what he has to say. Sister Revolutions is a public history project. Um, about the revolutionary history of Charlottesville, Virginia, and our French sister city, Besançon. And so for this project, we went to Besançon, we explored um, a lot of the buildings there and talked to a lot of public historians there. Um, and then it all culminated in a class that we taught last spring that had three students working on the final episode of the series. Um, in basically, they, they got to take their the direction of their interviews in whatever way they wanted to um and uh whereas the first three episodes really explore like the history of the french revolution in besançon the fourth episode is more about the legacy and how we remember the revolutionary time period in the colonial time period in charlottesville today so it talks a lot about race and um about just Charlottesville and, and some of the, the weirdness of, of UVA. <laughs> okay, let's take a listen to Ben. Really drawn to the community-based aspect of podcasting. As an academic, you're often writing and it can be a very solitary practice. Um, you can kind of, in the space of your imagination, give yourself the impression that you're like communing with the ancients when you go to the library, but podcasting at a certain point involves working with other people and thinking through ideas in a, in a format that feels alive. And in a way, when you go back to writing articles and books, you take that sense of dialogue and vitality with you. You know, I've never really sat down to think about how would Sister Revolutions look if I tried to write it as an essay or as a book. You know, it might be a little bit of a tighter argument in some ways, but I think doing it in podcast form really forefronted the different voices of the people that we met. It allowed us to expand a huge network that we never, I mean, we never would have met all of the people that we met in Franche-Comté and Besançon or in Charlottesville. Um, so I found it as a really useful project to get different perspectives other than my own and to actually realize like, oh man, like these people know a lot. And so I think making Sister Revolutions was a great way to, to really suss out what that interface is between the scholar and the public. I think it definitely kind of instilled in me a kind of humility in my writing. Public media could be more intellectual and more well-researched and more factual and more supported. Academics can play a, a role in that as a kind of public service. I don't mean in the like, like we will descend from on high and tell the people how things are, but that, you know, we have a lot of public resources invested in research and in higher education. The challenge, I think, is that, you know, scholars aren't accustomed to necessarily wanting or needing to be involved in a project like this. You know, it, for a lot of folks, it's really, um, it's really about these peer-reviewed publications. That's the venue in which these conversations are, are aired. I remember you know, early on, you gave me this feedback with one interview of like, that was shop talk. 
like you're in the weeds you haven't explained to the listener what's going on like you guys are just off on a tear and this is like you and your buddy in a studio with microphones like without having the audience in mind or without the same audience in mind right this is really helpful because as a writer you think a lot of times of the audience of specialists but really even then it just helps so much in the audio format once you're kind of recording and editing something it's very very hard to go back and to start tweaking and changing things when you write an essay you know because writing is this iterative process of thinking in a word processor you can go back to page one and change the introduction again it's a little more complicated to get back in the studio and go through the motions of re-recording. So there's a, a higher bar for that. Okay, so I, I see a question uh, right now and I'll address that. Um, how did students get involved with the Sister Revolutions project? How did that collaboration un unfold? So essentially, this is gonna get a little bit into the weeds, but I'm uh, a, an audio producer specifically associated with Brown Residential College, which is it's really just a dorm of undergrads, um, but it's also a uh, like a living and learning community. Ben was one of the faculty fellows there, so we were already kind of set up in a a, um, a cloistered environment where we were in, encouraged to uh, collaborate. Um, and then Brown College offers certain uh, interdisciplinary courses every like one or two every semester um, that are technically open to the rest of the university community, but like they're mostly pushed towards the students who live there. Um, and we just had three students. It was a really small group, but it allowed us to go pretty deeply into the, the type of research they were doing and, and um, their interviewing. And um, so that's how that happened. Um, I had mentioned that this project had a lot of contributors. So the initial grant came from Ben writing uh, a proposal to the Charlottesville Sister Cities Committee. Um, and once we were granted that, we also received funding from, um, oh, America uh, 2026, which is an international symposium on the revolutions, the age of revolutions. And uh, we also received funding from Brown College itself. Um, WTJU contributed in the sense that we were, you know, very involved in some of the recording of it. Um, and I believe there were a few others that I'm not coming and up with. I right believe now. the student involvement was written in. Yes. To all oh, of, yeah. Like that absolutely. was part of the project proposal. Definitely part of the original proposal that we wanted to. Um, to eventually bring students into the fold and um, and, and I collaborate. Believe, I mean, we have a lot of thoughts on working with students. We work with a lot of students, so we're happy to talk about that more at the end. But I also want to plug that I think there is at least one other session about working with students. Um, I think it was the last session, actually. Oh, yeah. Well, Maybe. they're all recorded, right, <laughs> yeah. Rebecca? Yes, and Sebastian will be speaking to this very topic in the next oh, time wonderful. session as well. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, so opening it up, just again, let's, you know, talk a little bit, discuss the things that Ben said. Um, again, he's providing more of the perspective of the career academic in this line of, of project. Um, was there anything that resonated? Was there anything you were surprised by? Anything that rankled? <laughs> anything like that? Um, I know for me, the funniest part of the clip uh, with Ben is when he talks about me telling him in the studio that like he's in the weeds and like this tape is not going to make sense to anyone who doesn't also have a PhD in French history. Um, that's something that I find that I do all the time with professors that I work with um, and is really fun honestly to me like i really enjoy um taking massive amounts of knowledge mm -hmm. that that the people i work with have access to and trying to open the door a little bit to our general listeners he also brought up um you know the idea that he 
talk to more people for this project than he probably would have if it had just been a paper. Um, and I think that's something interesting about making narrative podcasts that, you know, there's like a This American Life adage that people don't listen to any one voice for more than 90 seconds. So it kind of requires, if, I mean, that's not a hard and fast rule, but like that approach to it sort of requires you to go out and find a lot of different people that can like contribute to your project. And I do think often you end up in a different place than you might if you had been primarily going to an archive or if you had like relied on a, you know, another scholar just looked at a syllabus. Oh, very interesting. Podcast or parish. I have never heard that phrase. <laughs> that is so interesting. Um, no. Have you heard that? I'm definitely familiar with the sentiment that like, I've heard faculty and graduate students and stuff be like, they want us to do podcasts with our students. Like everybody wants us to do podcasts. <laughs> like, yeah, I will say what we what we I guess we see that in action, not necessarily people saying that, but um, what we experience sometimes is we'll have like a department be like, we need a podcast and we'll be like, OK, great. Like, let's really break it down. Like, what's it going to be about? Who's yeah. going to host it? And they're like, we need a podcast. Um, so sometimes that's what we, we deal with is sort of this um, sort of need or th th this feeling of desire to have that thing. Um, without actually a lot of clear intent behind yeah. it. It just becomes kind of a, a thing tacked on, which to be honest is great for us. Yeah. Like <laughs> if, if departments want to just be making podcasts, we are here to make their podcasts for them. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. a book on this topic, does but anybody, not a podcast. Does anybody want to like quickly recap what that book is about since it's been brought up? Rebecca? This is Kim Fox. Oh, thanks. I'm, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much about, you know, in academia, yes, you want to have the scholarship in terms of a text based scholarship, but how about this other form, this thing that you all are talking about and just doing, making that count toward tenure and things like that? Uh, there are other people in the room, like John Sullivan, he might want to chime in. That was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's like um, it's advocating for more research dissemination, like through the format. Awesome. Very cool. OK. Yeah, and yeah. It's also about just generating ideas uh, through that in an iterative process through podcasting, that it's about a way of knowledge discovery. That's not about you put out ideas and then the conversation starts. It's about generating ideas through conversation. Perfect. I absolutely love that. I will definitely check that out. Yeah. Um, something that wasn't in the clip, but was definitely in my conversation with Ben. So Ben uses podcast almost like exclusively as his assignment tool um, oh, for now students. for his students. For So uh, I think for him, he's really sick of reading chat GPT written papers. Mm -hmm. And while there are tools that will try to make podcasts <laughs> with AI these days, uh, we were just listening to one at a, an internal meeting the other day, um, that uh, he finds that the sort of... Um, energy in which podcasting requires his students to engage with their topic is like way better of a, an indication of how much they're engaging. And um, he also likes the, specifically he mentioned the way that podcasting encourages people to sort of speak casually, but with confidence and knowledge is a really good skill that he likes seeing his students develop. Um, and just so you know, he is a, a fellow at the U, at UVA who works in the engagements um, program, which is our, our uh, core program for first year students. So what he is often seeing are, are people coming in from high school and he's trying to prep them, even though they're talking about, you know, a historical subject matter, he's trying to prep them to engage with larger academia um, and really loves podcasting because of it. And I love that Kem said, I support 10,000 podcasts a <laughs> semester. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I uh, I just think it's a, a great way for for people to express. So I'm so cool glad that's cool work that's come there. out of it too. Like, yeah, absolutely. Another thing that Ben and I talked about was um, 
there's been a lot of evidence and thing uh, articles written and, and studies that are ongoing about whether or not college students read books anymore at all. Um, I was actually supposed to interview a scholar at Brown College today, but she had to uh, reschedule who just recently sort of had a big um, conversation with a group of our students at the residential college um, about their reading habits and uh, and you know so so we're going to make some podcasts about people not reading but something we talked about <laughs> in our conversation <laughs> was that um, something Ben enjoys is I mean Ben as a PhD has read tons and tons of books about his subject matter. And he said there's this moment in that process where you have this giant corpus of work and your brain starts changing in this way that you're thinking about it. You're starting to see the field of study um, and not just kind of one perspective at a time. And what he feels about podcasts is that the form can actually give you know, a relative lay person that experience of seeing a, such a broad point of view on a huge subject um, a lot faster than than them going through like an entire master's degree. Um, and I, I, I think that's a, a real and granted, they're not the same, right? And people should still be reading. But uh, an hour of listening to a podcast, you might be able to learn more than just an hour of reading a single book. So um, there's a little bit of a, hey, let's you know, capture people's attentions. We've got uh, watching podcasts on Spotify and YouTube. Um, yeah, the data yep. really bears that out. Yeah, YouTube is definitely very important. Um, and I, I don't know if you all are aware there's like, not just podcasts on YouTube, but video essays, which are like basically rant podcasts on YouTube are huge right now. They're very, very popular. Um, what Ben mentioned about not talking down to the audience remains critical with engagement and accessibility, especially considering that most listeners go to the medium to learn. Absolutely. That's another great place where both if you're an academic working a podcast or if you are a sound producer working with academics, we always need to be making sure that that this is coming from a, a place of sharing and not of uh, I don't know, look, yeah, looking down upon, talking down to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Google Notebook yeah. podcast. Yeah, it, things are things are a little rough on the reading front, but hey, <laughs> audio. Um, let's see, where are we going next? OK. So. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so our proposal is basically that partnerships between academic institutions and media producers is an ideal environment for the next era of in-depth narrative podcasting. It's, it's really a huge part of my career here at UVA. Um, and we just sort of see this opportunity for, for resource sharing between these two um, groups and sometimes I mean granted we're part of the university um, most universities have radio stations and student groups who are associated with some form of audio production so it, it can be an in-house thing but um, it could also be not it could also be more of a, a partnership structure um, now we talked a little bit about advantages and challenges when we listen to those two perspectives um, but I just want to reiterate, these are sort of the ones that I, there's a lot more, but, um, you know, of course, the advantages are that we have a, a wealth of knowledge with the expertise at a university. There's lots of resources and capital and equipment, um, and there's a multitude, multitude of non-commercial funding sources that um, are, even though they are not always the safest form of funding, they are in the grand scheme of things, actually a little bit more stable than uh, some of the other options. Um, and then the challenges. So bridging the cultural gap. So that's when we're talking about, you know, creating content that is both rigorous in terms of, of knowledge, but approachable and, and listenable. Um, then attracting listeners beyond the university. This is one we don't have answers to this one. This is like our challenge for sure um, is is making sure that, you know, people who have nothing to do with UVA find our podcasts. 
that's a big one. Um, and then time and especially prior- the yeah. podcasts that don't have to do with UVA, like oh, the exactly. podcasts that are really just showcasing research that's happening here. Yeah, but that's got national implications. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then time and priority, making sure that we're not uh, over relying on on people. So universities are extremely busy. <laughs> uh, everyone's doing a bunch of things all the time. Um, and just it, it can be a challenge to uh, to make sure things flow the way they would outside of a university. Yeah. So. You know, one of the reasons we wanted to do this presentation was because there are a, we work with a lot of interview based shows and we've definitely done some really cool narrative shows, but sometimes it's a little tricky to like convince folks <laughs> to do to try narrative. Um, so that was kind of like the reasoning behind the presentation, but it sounds like a lot of people here do narrative podcasts like how did you get your show started like why did you pick narrative anybody willing to share i'll say so this is a little shameless plug for a very old project i worked on called unique by nature Um, I worked on it when I worked at Allegheny Mountain Radio, which is a community network out in the um, Allegheny Highlands of uh, Virginia and West Virginia. And Unique by Nature is the story of the beginning of that network. And uh, it's basically, it's just four episodes. And the reason I wanted to tell it was because I had worked at the radio station for like two years at that point. And then... I realized I like knew nothing about how it had started, even though I knew one of the guys who had founded it. Like, I I just didn't know that story. And I really wanted it to be told because I was very passionate about community media. And it's I found it to be a very inspiring story of like how people in the middle of West Virginia decided they needed a radio station. Um, And so for me, the story and like the the greater significance and impact of those stories has always been a big uh, a big one. Okay, what do we have here? Yeah, um, y- please do just come off mute if you have something to share. That would be great. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Lynch. I am an audio producer. I work at the Think Tank New America. Um, and I kind of stumbled into narrative podcasting. I had, you know, already worked in live radio and had done some chat podcasts. Um, and came across this story that I knew I really wanted to make some, create something on. Um, And again, someone mentioned this earlier, there are certain stories that you have to tell in a narrative format. You can't, you can't tell just via, you know, uh, a bunch of interviews. Um, And so, you know, it was was a a case in my city that involved a wrongful conviction. And so I um, just, yeah, uh started doing all the research doing all the interviews and kind of it took a long time but um wove it all together very cool thank you for sharing (laughs) we're just reading some of these comments that have come in the chat thank you all too let's see um Uh, i'm uh, brad minnick Uh, i do a podcast at um university of little rock arkansas it's called arts and letters it's also broadcast, but it's much more a uh, podcast. But I just wanted to thank you all for imagining that a narrative focus can find its way in a university as a kind of different way of thinking. And for a couple of reasons. One is we also do, it's, it's kind of a profile show, but we also imagine that scholars, you know, professors at universities, and I'm one, they don't really know what each other are doing in other departments. And this really gives that option to kind of learn about that. I think one of the issues though has been, um, although you want your students to do podcasts, where does this stand in relation to scholarship for professors in departments? And the last thing I was gonna say is, uh, one thing that you might think about in terms of trying to promote your podcast, if it's just a podcast locally, would be uh, talking to your recruitment group at the university, because this could be amazing recruitment tool for different departments or for professors or coming in. And I bet you they could put it out there in a lot of different forums. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you for that. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm loving the all of the things I'm seeing in the comments in the chat. Um, 
Uh, it looks like there's a big focus on like local and just like trying to go for a deeper connection with with people that you're reaching, which I, I feel very strongly about um, and, and, and think that podcasting really does do. Um, especially in our like very, again, yeah, like the social media shallowness, it really kind of extends beyond that. Um, and then, yeah, voice as a, as a choice. And this is, this is how you do it. Uh, I, I certainly am a sucker for engaging stories. <laughs> so um, yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to just sort of finish off and, and explain to you exactly what our situation is here at our university. And that will, if, if anything we've said is like so out of left field and you're like, what are they talking about? That sounds really hard to create or hard to do in, in my situation. Hopefully this can kind of give you an, a little bit of context of where we're coming from with this. Yeah, so WTJU, like we said at the beginning, is an almost 70-year-old FM radio station, and it was started by students at UVA. And then over time, um, more and more community members joined the station and got on the air. And, you know, over the course of decades, really, it became more of like a community member space that was owned by the university. And so starting about 15 years ago, um, there was a real like realignment of the station um, to like maintain its identity as like connecting UVA to the community, but also um, to like extend the educational mission of UVA. And so as part of that, they started an all student station um, on top of the community member station. And we started this podcast collective and the podcast collective really kind of started and grew organically like some of the students that were coming in here to do their weekly radio shows were like you got a lot of microphones in there that you're not using all the time <laughs> you know could we come could we come record podcasts in your space and you know the answer was yeah come on in and that kind of evolved into this idea almost like a public library model that we have for the podcast collective that's run by wtju which is you know, we have a podcast studio that we're sitting in here. Um, we actually have two now. And um, anyone affiliated with the university, not affiliated with the university, can come to us with their podcast idea and um, we will train them and they can use our space for free. We will meet with them and kind of workshop their ideas. Um, we'll give them feedback. We'll help them get it out on all the podcast platforms and connect with the other podcasters at UVA. Um, and so, you know, I think at its, I really think of the mission of the Virginia Audio Collective, which is the podcast collective I've been talking about at WTJU, as um, giving people the tools to tell their own stories. Um, you know, especially when I started, it was um, only about a year after the Unite the Right rally here. And some of the first people that I worked with were people who came in and were like, oh my gosh, I've been interviewed by every major news network and I don't think anyone's getting the story right. You know, I wanna, I wanna come in and like tell it on my terms. Um, so that's who we are. And um, all the resources I just mentioned are free, but we do also work with a number of departments at UVA um, who like contract with us to make their podcasts. Um, so, you know, they'll come to us with an idea and um, we'll kind of help them make it happen by doing all the recording and editing and stuff for them. And then, like we've been talking about, most of our narrative projects have been, you know, kind of co-imagined with partners at the university where you know, we or somebody like that we have a partnership like Ben Bernard at Brown College will have an idea and we'll go out and like find the grant funding for it and then also think about how are we going to have like community input, how are we going to get students involved, like um, those sorts of things. Am I leaving anything else? No, yeah, I would just say it is like what we're, our situation is very much the marriage of community media and university as a community resource mm -hmm. um, is really what our, our sort of mission is. Um, finally, I, I just want to say really quickly, like, how do you get started? So say that you've never done narrative and you've only done like interview, um, I, you know, start small and just just try it out. Um, I, I think using what you already have, if you have like a series of interviews and some of them have to do with each other or are about similar um, subjects or show different viewpoints on the same subject, 
um, take three of them and see if you can sort of tell the story, split them up, tell the same story and give, give uh, the different viewpoints as you go along. Um, also a big thing to keep in mind and something I tell every single student who I ever teach to audio edit or try to do any sort of audio storytelling is that frustration is not a sign of failure. It is a very, very baked in part of the process. Um, and there are going to be moments of just like, I've listened to this track too many times and I don't know what the important part is. Um, and I guess a lot of times the answer to that frustration is community. It's bouncing it off another person. It's having someone listen to it and be like, does this make any sense? Um, and then also just find your voice and experiment. Um, I, I think what Adrian was telling me about uh, their desire to hear really experimental stuff um, is something for all of us to sort of keep in mind. Not that we're gonna necessarily release a bunch of highly experimental podcasts, but it is something to say like, yeah, we can we can do something a little bit different. We can break up the 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 structure that we've we've been using. Okay, anything else before we go to questions? No, I think that's it. Also, I love that everybody's dropping their um, podcast yes. links in there. <laughs> so many to check out. Yeah, but does anybody have any questions or thoughts to add? I wonder, Brooke, do you want to unmute and ask your question about College and University Podcast Studio? Mm. Sure. Um, yeah, I was just basically, um, I just sort of ended up in this world of this uh, conference by accident. And so I'm just um, having a fun time explain, uh, exploring this whole side of podcasting I hadn't ever really considered. I was, I've always just done it, um, luckily, professionally. And um, so I'm curious, it's almost like this, well, I could be completely wrong. It's almost like this underground industry. It's sort of behind these university walls, right? Mm -hmm. That's the sense I get, at least. And so I'm just wondering if, is there a network of university or college podcast studios that are connected with each other and communicate with each other about training skills, ideas, production, any of that? So the first thing I'll say is that um, my understanding of that only really happens through the connection of college radio stations with each other. Mm -hmm. we're, we're actually having the Virginia College Radio Conference here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, our student station does not produce any podcasts right now. It's really hard to get them to produce podcasts. Hmm. Um, now, I think MG will have some, some actual tangible answers for you. What I can say is that like things are extremely siloed even within the university. So I just met last week with a guy who like put together some sound studios in some of our academic buildings. And he's like, I just want people to use it. And, and so we had this conversation about how like, there's a bunch of different recording places all over grounds, which is what we call campus. I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of like centralized information about them. So I um, I think there's a lot of space for growth, just even within a singular academic institution, mm -hmm. um, but definitely between institutions. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, Sounds Greg fun. just dropped the link in the chat, but um, we talked last week about this a little bit and they, I think, are trying to do this, right? Greg, do you wanna? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can't see myself. Yeah. So with higher ed pods, we're, we're trying to create that community and a directory of higher education podcasts, uh, in, and in, in so that these podcasts can be surfaced and so that we can all kind of find each other as well. And, and improve. yeah, cool. That sounds awesome. Sounds super fun. I love this for y'all. I want to do it. <laughs> 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 sounds fun. Um, but there's definitely, yeah, like, like I said, there's, there's so much we can do uh, to, to connect each other better. Um, I'm just reading I think, up you on know, the this, chat. This conference too is such a cool like community to start building. And I saw that Chioki is on the call and um, he runs Resonate Podcast Festival mm. in Richmond, which we just went to for the third time. And it's amazing. 
and getting to go to a conference and talk to like a bunch of other people who make podcasts is really fun. So um, I think stuff like that is really cool for like building those collaborations and making friends. <laughs> Any other questions? Or again, thoughts, like suggestions for other folks. Hi, I'm totally new to this just like Brooke. So I was wondering how um, open academia is to having like an outsider come to them and present an idea for a show or um, something like that. Yeah, so it really depends on the institution a lot. Um, for instance, UVA is a public university, like part of our, our mandate is definitely to be open to a little bit of, of that public scholarship or just um, interaction. Um, do you have opinions about that? About how to pitch yeah. to acad academia? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of great resources online about how to pitch a project in general. So I would start with that. like. Um, you know, thinking about audience and thinking about scope and like what are your goals and stuff like that. And then I would I would look for like community radio stations or college radio stations, um, maybe to partner with or at least to chat with about that. Um, and then like I would imagine you could approach a department. Um, yeah, and it, it'll also depend on like if there's a certain professor. Some some professors like they do they do their professor stuff and then they go home and they don't talk to people. And then other professors are like, I live for the like, I'm this person and I'm very accessible. So it really depends on on the the given case. But uh, a lot of professors already have podcasts or are looking to start them. Also, when it comes to university presses, there's also a lot of um, literary magazines. Yeah. Every every uh, university has some sort of um, periodical publication that they put out. Um, those spaces are often a little bit more open to exploring the experimental side of of um, production. Does anybody have experience with this? Or oh, Kim, yeah. Oh, I don't have an answer to the question. I just had a different question. So I you can you can answer that. In a few more minutes. Yeah. Does anybody else have thoughts on that that first question about prof yeah. Target a professor department. Yeah. yeah. It depends on the goal. Um yeah, there it's sort of just if you can get in I I know this is such a vague answer but like getting in with the right people um who are open to that type yeah. of collaboration well and I'll also shout out there's this thing called the here now newsletter um you can just google it it'll pop up and it's just like a super comprehensive list of like grants fellowships like you know um that kind of stuff you know a lot of which is connected to academia so if you have like a pretty solid idea and what you want is like institutional support you could also go there and look for things that are a good match for your project and like especially the ones that are connected to like universities and stuff often in addition to like funding or whatever they're providing they'll also connect you with like resources yeah institutional support um, the other thing I'll say is that some universities or a lot of universities have their own sort of grant um, giving structures for public scholarship um, that like there are at times, you know, professors or departments who are looking to do a big like documentary project project and they'll um, basically shop around for for a team to to do that on, you know, and and. Um, so those are things to just sort of become aware of, like what universities are close to you, what they're doing in terms of podcasting already, or if anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm Kim is also, yeah, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Um, All right, Kim, okay. what was your question? Sorry, um, <laughs> I'm just taking notes. Um, okay, so I support a million <laughs> podcasts every semester and I go into classes and um, I do have a background in media um, 
I am probably the few who don't listen to podcasts very regularly, but I do listen to a lot like for being able to like properly support classes and stuff. Anyways, my question is like, um, I actually find as you've stated multiple times, like narrative as a form is like, it's very, um, there's a lot of work that goes into like creating a narrative podcast. Um, and so typically for like assignments, we'll move towards more like discussion based, even interview has its own art. Right. Um, and so I wondered if you have any like resources that you kind of point to, to help people think through that are like, I know there's a million online, but I wondered about your particular resources that you might share with someone trying to develop a narrative podcast in an academic space to like help, um, maybe more in there, like, here's my script and I'm trying to understand that arc or something like that in a particular, specifically in podcasts. I wondered if you had anything to share or anyone, I guess, in the, in this room. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, I have a, uh, a slideshow that I can send to you that I just gave to a group of students that was just about like, um, the, the iterative pro process of, of storytelling and, um, basically uh how th the ways in which narrative in audio differs slightly than like narrative in writing books or like a story um and it's it's only in like kind of slight ways that that is is super different or rather different in many of the models that we use you know as saying that's a great podcast um I, I guess to like, just to, cause what, one thing I find too, I do have to help them make the distinctions between, for example, like writing a paper and then writing a script. Cause yeah. a lot of times people will, can just kind of record themselves reading yeah. a paper Absolutely. and switching off and on. And you're like, that's not quite so the right thing. One tip that I have, and you're probably already doing this, but it's like, I, I like to work with people really one step at a time. So they come in and they're like, I have an idea. And I'm like, great. And then I'm like, okay, you know, go schedule some interviews. And then once the interviews are scheduled, that's when we do tech training. And then once the interviews are recorded, and this is for people who are like brand new to it. So it's not quite as overwhelming. Um, oh, I had a thought about the story arc, but now it's gone. So go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I am a big like intuitive pusher, I guess, where like things give us chills when we listen to them because they like they give us chill like there's nothing super logical about it it's a very emotional platform um and so i often instruct people to to uh when they're first getting into narrative is thinking about golden moments right mm -hmm. or what we would call radio gold and so not listening to how do i tell every you know beat of information that someone needs mm -hmm. but rather listening to a piece and saying what part was like ooh that that on its own is like the the beautiful moment right the golden moment um and if you can find like you know usually in like any given interview there's like a handful of those mm -hmm. and if you then take the handful of those and say okay are all of these super important yeah and then you structure those as your like hit points of the story and you only give as much information as you need to support those golden moments that's like yeah. my super quick and dirty like how does this differ then from from written storytelling and that's something you can actually turn into an exercise too right yeah. like you can say okay you've gone and recorded all this tape like by next week send me what your golden moments are yeah, yeah something something we do is uh like create a promo for this so like find the golden moment and then create narration around it another uh great tool is like having students digest or anyone digest information put the notes away and go on mic for like 10 minutes and talk about what they just learned and then using that as the you know the hel helping to structure mm. your your flow yeah um those are just like i remembered my, my tip <laughs> yeah what's your tip which is especially like when working with you know people who are new to podcasting and if they're having trouble telling the story i'll be like go find something similar to listen to and chart it out and then 
try charting your story on the same like trajectory trajectory and then be like okay what's working what's not working um but i think especially with people who are new to podcasting you know they say to be a better writer you need to read more and so sometimes when people are stuck what they need to do is go listen to more things and actually pay attention to how those things are put together and that'll help them like think about how they're gonna put theirs together Oh yeah, strive for the five seconds that is the core of the story. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it sounds like we're we're yeah, kind sorry, of at we're the out end. of time. <laughs> um, but thank you all so, so, so much. Um and uh we we are just constantly talking about podcasts. So um anyone can hit us up at any time and we'll talk about podcasts more. Like way longer than you asked yeah. for. <laughs> um but uh thank you um is there any way we can get like a a print out of the chat because there's so many links in yeah. it let me see what i can do when you copy and paste it turns out pretty ugly but it's gonna okay. have all the info you need <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay well everybody you go copy so those links real quick before you leave then yeah. oh thank shiva so has a quick uh that. Yeah, absolutely. Sheba has a quick request. Would you guys be willing to drop um, contact information? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Perfect. And while you're doing that, everybody, thank you so much for being here. We have one more pair of sessions happening today. It's going to be at five o'clock Eastern. If you're looking for session seven, best practices for building a podcast network within your university, you can stay right here on the Zoom and just mute yourself and turn off your video and come back in about 45 minutes. If you're looking for session eight, best practices for podcasting as political inquiry and action, you can click on the UCA Zoom that is in the post I made. Don't forget that you can also check in on the best practices document, throw in your two cents, comment on what's already in there. And Sage and Mary Garner, it was so good to see you guys again. Thank you so oh, much for doing you. this. Come yeah. back and visit. <laughs> Rebecca used to live in Charlottesville and hang out with us all the time at TJ. <laughs> she made two podcasts for Virginia Audio Collective. There's one right next to Sage's head on the wall. <laughs> Wait, where is, is that, that legal knowledge right there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. You're above Sage's head. I don't know if that one's like nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you maybe again at five o'clock Eastern.